Yes, welcome back to Home Studio Q&A for yet another week here on Studio Live today. My name is Pete and this is our show all about home studio, mobile recording, garage band, iPads and iPhones, you name it, we talk about it. If you can do it in the home studio or in the mobile studio, we're going to cover it. I've got a bunch of questions that we're going to get to in a moment and we are here live on Facebook and YouTube. We're here every Sunday morning if you're here in Australia, Saturday night in the US and Canada, Saturday afternoon in the US and Canada and Saturday evening if you're in the UK and Europe. Hope you can join me live for a future show. Or if you're watching on the replay, don't worry, we love you just as much. If you have comments or questions or anything else, please drop them in the chat or the comments. And if you're listening on the podcast replay, we also love you. You can head over to studiolivetoday.com to find the different ways that you can get in touch. Now, at the start of each of these Q&A shows, I, I talk about a feature topic. And this week, I'm going to talk about something that has been coming up more and more. And it's related to the current situation. We're here in May 2020, where we've got some significant challenges in the world. And the topic of, of anxiety, more generally, but as it relates to music, is something that I wanted to touch on. So I'm going to jump in here and just share a little bit of information to get started. So anxiety is something that affects a lot of people. The stats vary, but it's a huge chunk of people that are affected by anxiety, depression, and other mental challenges, mental health challenges. Now, first and foremost, I am not a professional counsellor. So if you are suffering with anxiety, depression, mental illness, or anything, please, there are plenty of places and people that you can talk to. If you don't have anyone within your inner circle that you trust or that you can talk to or that you feel comfortable with, there are heaps of organisations. Here in Australia, Beyond Blue is the organisation that you need to look up and go to. In other parts of the world, there will be places. If you search anxiety in your location, there will be organisations that can help you out. So I wanted that up right up front because you shouldn't be taking all of your mental health advice from a dude on YouTube. But that being said, I have had experiences and I wanted to share those with you just to let you know what's worked for me. Won't work for everyone, but it might give you some ideas and strategies that might actually help. So anxiety is kind of related to two things. It's related to yourself and it's related to others. But a lot of people sort of put a lot of emphasis on the other people stuff. They think anxiety is driven by other people and what other people think and not so much themselves. We're going to talk about both of these here in this one. Um, now, the, the self... It relates to music, but it also relates to other parts of life. I've talked about these things before, but the imposter syndrome, if you've never heard of this, this is where you are doing something and you know, you're know you going along nicely, you're feeling good. So from a musical point, you're recording music, you think it's sounding good, you're playing it back. And then suddenly you get this overwhelming feeling that's like, who am I to write a song? Why, why should I think I, my music's any good? Like you have this. And if you've ever started a new job, you often feel that when you're starting a new job. You're like, oh, they're going to work. They're going to find out I'm a complete fraud. I'm an imposter. I don't know what I'm doing. It's usually not the case. It's usually a complete overreaction, but it definitely comes in, especially in music. The other thing that's very a self thing is perfectionism. So thinking that you have to do something, but the first time you do something, it has to be perfect. Now, we all know, or you know, um, in the logical part of your brain, the non-emotional reactive part of your brain, that that's not the case. When you start something new, when you learn to walk, you don't expect a kid to go, oh, you put them on your feet and they walk. It's the same with anything, the same with music. You are going to grow. Your first song is very unlikely to be your best song. You need to rinse and repeat and make a bunch of songs to actually overcome that. But the big thing is caring what other people think. And if you think about like the public speaking analogy, this is, this is what a lot of people think of. So that whole fear of public speaking is not so much about you fearing the act of getting up. You can probably do it yourself in front of no one, but it's the fear of what may happen and what other people may think. And this is a, a concept that I've, I, I, I didn't coin this term, but I like to use it and it's catastrophizing. So it's What's the worst thing that can happen? So for public speaking, you know, the worst thing that can happen is the old thing of you standing up there, you have that dream that you're standing there and you're, suddenly you're in your underwear and everyone's laughing and pointing at you. That doesn't actually usually happen or that you're going to completely freeze up and then you're going to faint on stage and then you're going to have a heart attack and be rushed to hospital. And it's like, these things simply aren't going to happen. But in our brains, we go that way. We cycle through it and we go, okay, this happens and then this happens and then this happens. What's the worst thing that can happen? And that's what we go to. Same sort of thing with an open mic night. You might think, I'm not going to play an open mic night because what will people think? Well, here's the harsh reality and the truth. Other people simply don't care about you as much as you think. 
Now, no, that sounds bad. Don't worry. Your inner circle do care about you. Your family and friends probably do care about you. But strangers on the internet, dudes drinking beer in a pub, uh, dudettes drinking beer in a pub, anyone, like, they've got enough of their own stuff to deal with, right? They don't really have a whole bunch of care factor around you and exactly what you're doing. Now, there are a small percentage of people who may send hate your way, who attack you in an unprovoked way. They might, But here's the thing. They are probably dealing with more significant issues than what you are. Because here's a statement that I like to say. Think about this. Caring, empathetic people simply don't make other people feel bad for no reason. I'll say it again. Caring, empathetic people simply don't try to make other people feel bad on the internet or in real life without being provoked, without provocation. It's just the facts. So think about that and you do need to think about where these things are coming from. All right. That's all good, Pete, but what can I actually do about it? If I'm stuck, if I'm struggling and I'm, I'm creating music and, and anxiety is bringing me down and it's making it hard. Well, the thing with anxiety is it is not something that you like take. There's no magic bullet. You don't sort of have anxiety and then you get over anxiety and then suddenly you don't have it. It's something that you have coping mechanisms for. So I'll talk, I'll tell you a quick story and then I'll give you some coping mechanisms here. So my anxiety uh, in the past was driven by a few things. And one of the weird ones was supermarkets. So I really didn't like going into supermarkets. I would get anxious. I felt trapped. A lot of my um, anxiety was around sort of claustrophobic enclosed situations. So that was really hard for me. And the other one was driving in the car. So you can imagine a trip to the shop was a great time. Woo, yeah, I really looked forward to that. Uh, so for me, what a lot of people will do is they'll, they'll say, oh, just, you know, just suck it up and deal. Just use the sink or swim method. Just do it. That didn't work for me. You know, 10 panic attacks later, I'm still struggling with this. But what works for me and what one of the, the best strategies I find for, for life, but also for music, don't worry, we will circle back to music, is to actually do things a little bit at a time. I use this analogy. If you blow up a balloon, and parents will know this if you blow balloons for your children, if you just put as much air as you can into the balloon and you blow as hard as you can for a period of time, the balloon's going to pop. Like the, the resistance there is just going to go, ah, pop. But if you blow into the balloon, you let it rest for a minute, you let a little air out, you blow it a little bit bigger, let a little air out, you blow it a little bit bigger, it's going to eventually become this larger thing. And I think of your circle of comfort, your comfort zone as being like that. It starts little and then as you grow it out, it goes out like this. So if you're sitting there at the moment going, I don't have the confidence to share my music, I don't have the confidence to do the things that I want to do in music, to play open mic nights, to release my music, that's cool. And you don't have to do all those things right now. But put plans in place. Start thinking of what steps you can take to take that next step to get yourself a little bit closer. So for me, with the supermarket analogy, it was I would go for a couple of things and then I could go at quiet times where I could just go in and out and I wouldn't feel that. And as I as I kept doing this, I'm like, oh, that actually, you know, the world didn't end. I, I stopped catastrophizing because I was proving to the part of my brain that was doing this, the, the little uh, lizard almonds in there that make you feel this way, your fight or flight mechanism, I was proving that the worst thing wasn't going to happen. Same with live streaming. Yeah, you know, last week I had a live stream where my house alarm went off in the middle. I had a phone call from the security company. I had to go and disarm the alarm. That happens, but that's not the worst thing. No one cared. Like people cared very little about these sort of things. But people, we we overemphasize how much other people are going to care about these things. So, what can you do with your music though? Uh, yeah, share with a friend. Start by sharing with someone you trust. Then move on to a shared community of people you trust. Now, I recommend the Create, Record, Release group on Facebook because that's the group that I started and that's specifically set up to be a positive, nurturing environment for people to share their first, second, third, hundredth song and get positive but constructive feedback. You know, we don't want this whole American Idol mum thing where everyone just tells you that you're great. That's not going to help you either. But you can start getting more constructive stuff. And then you can continue expanding out to more public forums and all of the rest of it. So that is my recommendation is if you are struggling with anxiety, first of all, as we stipulated at the start, please seek professional help if you are struggling. That's the number one thing I want to get out there with this one. But if you are just sort of feeling a little bit of that anxiety kicking in and you're doing things within music, also step away. The two things that have made my life a lot better have been exercise and music. And now I'm, I'm very lucky that I can throw the backpack on, put the earbuds in and go walking for a couple of hours. I've got a supportive family that allow me to do that. And they also support me to do things like this around my music. And those things actually help 
as long as you address them and tackle them in the right way. So hopefully that can help out. Remember, remember that advice, caring, empathetic people, in other words, people you should take notice of, simply don't try to bring other people down without being provoked. So if you're catastrophizing about the worst case scenario that a stranger on the internet is going to say that you suck, it simply doesn't matter. That is enough of a rant. I don't normally rant quite that much, but uh, I just wanted to, to cover this because a lot of folks are coming to me and I still get probably 10 plus people per week saying, I want to create music, but I'm just too anxious about it. I'm too worried about what might happen if I put myself out there. Trust me, start small, build up, you'll be fine. Uh, if you have your own views and your own experiences to share, please do jump in and uh, let me know here in the chat or in the comments. But it is time to jump in to some questions from the last week. I had a question here from Jake Tyler, and this is about releasing music. So I thought this was relevant to kick off the questions with, and this is about how to get paid with DistroKid. So Jake says, when I share my referral link, does the person have to pay and then I get $5 off? Or do they just sign up? So yes, if you, so the question here is about DistroKid, who are the distributor that I use to release music. So with DistroKid for $19.99 per year, you can upload an unlimited number of songs, EPs, albums. I'm working on an EP at the moment and I'll be releasing it with DistroKid very soon. The good thing with DistroKid is they have a referral program. So if you use and love DistroKid, you can actually refer other people. You've got a, a special VIP link. You can refer other people to your link and then they'll get 7% off and you'll get a $5 referral fee. So the question here from Jake is, do they have to sign up? Yes. So as soon as they have paid their $19.99, DistroKid will give them 7% discount. So what's that a, a confusing amount, like $1.40 off of that or something like that? No, I can't do maths in my head. Um, yeah, so they'll get a discount and then you'll get a $5 referral fee. Now, of course, you can use my discount, my distro kid referral link. That's at studiolivetoday.com slash distro if you do want 7% off. And then once you've signed up, you too can refer people using your referral links. So hopefully that helped you and others with that question, Jake. Let's move on to this one from Scott Weaver. This is about plugging in USB hard drives and flash drives and other things with an iPad or an iPhone. So Scott says, uh, how can we do this if AC power isn't available? So the challenge with an iPhone, and I've had a few comments this week on my videos about this from folks saying, oh, so you can actually plug a USB drive into an iPad or an iPhone now. Way to catch up with, you know, Android 20 years ago, um, Apple. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, but here's the thing. Oh, that was a weird noise. Here's the thing. Um, yeah, you need additional power. So if you are plugging in your to an iPad or an iPhone with a lightning connection, you'll need the lightning to USB 3 adapter. I normally have it handy to show. I can't find it at the moment. You'll need the lightning to USB 3 adapter that has the additional power. Now you can plug that into AC power. If you don't have AC power, a portable battery, anything that's going to send that 5 volts of DC power is going to be fine. And that's the case with pretty much anything. Anything that requires AC power, it usually is going to down convert it without getting too technical. It's going to convert it into five volts of DC power, which you can provide from a portable battery. So even things like powered USB hubs, pretty much anything that you need to plug in, if you work out what it's rated for, so how much power it needs, and you've got a portable battery or a power bank that can provide that, then you can do that yourself. And uh, thank you to, to Jade, related to the last question, but yes, there's uh, there's my VIP link, distrokid.com slash VIP slash Pete Johns, and you'll get 7% off your first year. Or use Jade Star's link, or use someone else's link. But if you're going to sign up, use one of the Studio Live Today community members' links, and then uh, you will get things together. Let's move on here. A uh, question here from Gunter. Uh, this is about my new iPad Pro. So just a quick question. Does GarageBand take advantage of the higher screen resolution of a 12.9 iPad Pro, e.g. 10 tracks displayed vertically instead of eight on my iPad Air? Yes. So there's a few things that you get with the 12.9. Now you, you may be aware I did a video in the week. I've just upgraded and I got the 11 inch iPad Pro. I didn't go for the 12.9 inch iPad Pro. Uh, if you're watching here on the, the video, you'll see over my shoulder, there is my 12.9 inch iPad Pro first generation that I, that I bought secondhand a while ago. The benefit that you get from that is that it will actually give you more screen real estate. It does a couple of things. It will give you some more tracks vertically 
can't remember the exact track count, and it will give you things like more frets on the fretboards of your guitars, more keys on the keyboard of your, your piano, so you're going to be able to visualize more stuff on your screen. The other thing it will give you is even without a multi-channel interface, when you're recording a track, because your microphone or your guitar won't take up the whole view, you'll get a little window up the top that you can have as a little peek through to be able to see the tracks you're recording. So those are all reasonably useful things that you have that you can actually use um, but it's it's not it's not a game changer in my view so uh, yeah, if you do want that additional size and those additional tracks then yeah go, going with the large one can help functional functionally uh, able to actually do things it's not going to be a significant difference but it's really a personal preference i went for portability of the 11 inch which i can't hold up because it's down here displaying these uh, displaying these photos uh, but yeah if you did want the extra screen size you can indeed go for that let's continue on here uh, from Favor, this is a, around the iRig I.O. So I did a video about the iRig Pro I.O. And if you are in the market for any gear for your home or mobile studio, you can head over to studiolivetoday.com slash gear. You can check out the iRig Pro I.O. and all of the other stuff I recommend over at that link. But Favor has said, thanks for this information. Two questions. Considering all this, would I still... Uh, would I be able to still add the XLR for recording in that free slot on the iRig? And number two, what if my MIDI controller keyboard has no MIDI output slot? I'm asking because uh, I have a particular MIDI controller in, in mind and I want to be able to use the mic as well. So here's how it breaks down. <coughs> Excuse me. When you're connecting a lightning device, so the iRig Pro works in two ways. It works in a lightning mode and a USB mode. So let's pretend you have my old iPad, my iPad Air 2, and it has lightning connection and I plug it in via lightning. I can only then use that one device to plug in because lightning, unlike USB-A or USB-C, doesn't have the ability to have multiple data streams, meaning you can't plug two lightning devices or even a lightning device and something else into a lightning-based iPad. Now, this is disappointing for things like uh, you can't display on HDMI screen and use a lightning-based audio interface at the same time. It's a pain in the butt. But what you can do is you can use it in USB mode. So if you instead use the USB cable, use a lightning to USB 3 adapter and a powered USB hub. So yeah, you need some additional gear. Then you can hook up as many USB A devices as you have ports on your hub. Hook the port up, hook the hub up to your iPad via the lightning to USB 3 adapter and you're good to go. Now, in USB-C land with the iPad Pro, things are a bit different. You would use the USB connection anyway, and then you'd need a USB-C hub or some sort of USB-C uh, port replicator, uh, whatever you want to call it these days, and uh, that will get you going there. So in terms of that, and the other thing is with MIDI, uh, the iRig has the two little MIDI plugs you can put in the side. You can use those at the same time as the microphone, which is handy, uh, or if you've got a USB, based MIDI device, then you can use the powered USB hub option that I talked about before. That will help you and get you set up there. So hopefully that helps you out. Let's answer one more question and then we'll jump over and see if we've got any questions from the folks who are here live. This one's from KC7 and this is about, <coughs> this is about me coughing. This is a similar question around how to connect a USB audio interface to an iPad or iPhone. So KC7 says, would I be able to run my Tascam mixer into this Focusrite and then into an iPhone? Now, I'm getting a lot of questions about this because a heap of people are doing some live streaming at the moment, as well as a heap of home recording. So I wanted to cover this in a little bit of detail here, at answering this question. So what the question is being asked here is, can you get a mixer and then plug it into an audio interface and then plug that in via USB into your iPhone? 100% you can. So an audio interface, if it's a two-channel interface, it'll have stereo line in. So things like the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, my favorite interface, the Steinberg UR22C, they have two combo jacks on the front. So you can either plug in two microphones and use the preamp setting, or you can switch them to line level mode, plug in some quarter-inch TRS jacks, and then you've got two balanced inputs. So if you've got a stereo output on your mixer, which... Every, every mixer has that I've ever come across. All you need to do is get a cable, connect up the stereo output of your mixer to the stereo input of your interface, plug your interface into your iPhone, and boom, you've got that high quality stereo input from your mixer. You can plug in your guitars, your mics, your amps, your whatever, and then you can use that. And that's handy because you can use that to stream or to record or just use your camera app 
and then the audio coming through will be the audio from your interface. Here's the thing. If you don't have a mixer, this is a question I'm getting asked a lot is, hey, I've got a two-channel interface and I want a live stream, but when I plug in my mic, it all goes over on the left. Yes. So the way that a stereo, the way that a two-channel interface works is it simply uses the left and right stereo channels. So when you're recording on the left channel, the mic channel or channel one, it's recording on the left. When you're recording on channel two, it's recording on the right. So if you plug in a mic in the left and a guitar in the right, you guessed it, you live stream, you're gonna get the mic on the left, the guitar on the right. Now there's really no way around this apart from using an additional device. Now you can either do it the way we talked there, getting a mixer, going into an interface, or you can flip it around. You can use an interface and then use a second interface coming out of that interface. I know it's starting to sound weird, but you can use another interface into your phone so that it's actually sending the stereo signal out and then a stereo signal into your phone and mixing it down. But you will need some device in between to mix the left and the right down to mono. Obviously, if you're recording, you can fix that in editing. So you can just go into your uh, an audio editor or a video editor, and there's a lot of things things like um, fill fill the channels or something like that. There's different different uh, software has different options, but basically what it'll do if it's a if it's everything on the left or everything on the right, it'll just fill that and make it mono. It'll copy that across to both channels, and that can help out. But for live streaming a mixer or a single channel interface that only has one input can actually be a good thing because that will just pump mono audio out there, which is all you're really going to be able to do if you are live streaming a mic and a guitar and things like that. Righty dokey, let's jump on over and we'll see if we have any questions from the folks who are here live. I'm just looking for the word question. If you are here live and you have a question, please pop question in front of your question and we will answer that one. Uh, not really a question, but a question here from, uh, from Max says, uh, good to see you, Pete. How's the new iPad? It is good. I've just bought, a, as I mentioned, an iPad Pro 2020, the 11-inch Wi-Fi model, 512 gigabytes, since you asked. And it's going well. A few, I'm getting adjusted to not having a button, to not having a headphone jack, to using Face ID. It's just those early teething problems at the moment. But all in all, uh, it, it flies along. It does really well uh, in terms of performance. So I'm happy to learn to do a few new things. And once I get my USB-C interface setup happening, I think uh, we'll be a lot happier there. Fallen Creature says, question, can we make music without knowledge of music theory? Um, <laughs> yes. I was going to make a I was going to make a derogatory comment there about to the fact that there's plenty of people out there that uh, are calling themselves. No, I'm not I'm not going to even go there. Um, yes, you can absolutely you can. I, I realized I was about to. You know how at the very start I talked about people that that say things unprovoked to people on the internet. I was almost on the edge of being one of those people. But yes, what we've seen, let's put a positive spin on this. What we've seen by the pre prevalence of people making beats and creating instrumental tracks and backing tracks using loops, using Ableton, using FL Studio, using GarageBand, there is, it's never been easier to bring things together. It used to be that if you wanted to be a synth guy, you had to literally know how an analog synth worked and program it and tune everything in. Now you can throw on a synth patch and you can play a melody. You can throw on another synth synth patch and put a pad in you can add a beat using something like the virtual drums or the beat sequencer in a lot of this software so yes i think you can what knowledge of music theory helps you with is knowing what works with what it's like a shortcut so if you've got a good ear for music you'll hear something and you'll go there's something wrong with that that sound going into that sound doesn't sound right but you won't know why you won't know why you can't usually go from a c major chord to an f sharp major chord and it's going to sound wrong but if you have no theory, you'd know, well, F sharp major is not anywhere in the range of the C key. So you'd have to change keys completely. You'd probably better off using an F because C, F, G, A minor is what's in your, your wheelhouse there. So I think it's, it really just gives you a shortcut. I, I uh, compare it to touch typing. So can you write a book without knowing how to touch type? Yes, 100% you can. It's just going to take you a lot more hunting and pecking and trial and error if you can touch type, you'll probably do it in half the time. Will the end result be any better either way? Subjectively, probably not, but you're going to be able to get there a lot quicker. And in some cases, music theory can actually help you find something you wouldn't be able to find if you didn't have it. But what a really good question and something that I like talking about here on the channel because, yeah, it's up to you. Do what makes you happy and do what works for you. I'm just one person giving one bit of advice, but for for you, 
It may work, you may have the exact same experience, or it may be 100% completely different for you. Uh, I'll just see if we've got any other. Hello, we've got Oscar Garcia here, by the way. We've got Ian Skeggs is here as well. I hope you are doing well, my friends. Um, we would, uh, I'm just scrolling down here. Uh, a good, good, uh, good, good comment here from Oscar. Uh, we talked at the start about uh, about anxiety, and then Oscar says, "I'd like to share my experience with stage panic." Yeah, I've studied classical piano basically all my life. A large part of the studies focus on performance, uh, and Oscar goes on to say, "With lots of practice, you acclimatize, but you never get used to it." I have already finished my professional studies right now, and have performed on stage for a while. Fear never goes away entirely. And that's a really great point to make. And I didn't, I don't think I really sort of nailed that point down. But yeah, anxiety, like a lot of things, it's not something that is just, you don't just get it and then get rid of it. It is something, for better or worse, it's with you forever. And everyone has an opportunity. <laughs> it's it's non-discriminating. Yay. Everyone has an opportunity to experience it. And you may have never had it or you and then suddenly get it. Or you may be suffering from it. And then you finally find ways to overcome it. Well, not overcome, but to find coping mechanisms and ways to actually get on with life. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you for your uh, your contribution here to the channel. Uh, question here from George Milo. <laughs> Does the iPad 2020 have a headphone plug? If not, how are you adjusting? <laughs> yeah, so I think I, I covered that briefly just before. It does not. And how am I adjusting? Well, it's okay. Here in the studio, it's fine because my setup here, uh, I've showed this before. I, I did grab, oh, can I unplug it? Yeah, I'm not using, I'm not using it to plug anything in or for audio, but I did pick up the jet for $99, mind you, the genuine Apple USB C to USB, HDMI, and USB C connection. So this is handy because I can plug it into power by USB C. I can plug it into my screen via HDMI and then via USB into my USB hub. So the rest of my setup's exactly the same. So I already used a USB hub that I connect up my MIDI keyboard, my Steinberg UI22C, my wireless mouse and keyboard, and then any any uh, flash drives or hard drives that I need to. So I've already got that all set up. The only thing is that the power port that I have on my hub can't plug into the power port here because the lightning adapter doesn't kind of do it. Jade Star's come to the party. She's uh, shown me some cables I can get that will help with that. So we'll be up and running with that soon. But yeah, what, what has been a plane is I just took it into the lounge room and I just wanted to just plug my earbuds in just to hear something. And I couldn't. So I am going to have to pick up one of the little $10 bloody USB-C to, to three and a half mil adapters, similar to uh, this one that we have for lightning. So I'm going to have to carry extra, extra dongles. Yes, Dongle City. Welcome to Population Pete. All righty. Let's uh, continue on. Where did the, where did, where's that weird Italian accent coming from? Let's continue on. Um, question from Sun Ray. Has, would you ever consider downloading Logic Pro X to use with your Apple products for music production? Here's the small problem I have with Logic Pro uh, 10 or 10.5. is actually out now. I don't own a Mac right now. <laughs> So I have uh, two computers. I have two PCs, a laptop and a desktop PC. I have a couple of iPads now and a couple of iPhones, but I don't own a Mac. And someone actually said to me, which was a good question, and it might, might actually be in the questions here, but I'll answer it now and then we can skip over it if I did actually capture the question. But they said, um, why would you go for, you know, spend nearly $2,000 on an iPad Pro when for probably 500 more, you could have got a MacBook and had a lot more power, and a lot more flexibility. Well, there was a couple of reasons. Number one is because I run this channel, I get a lot of questions from folks about iPad Pro. And now that we've had the USB-C model out, the 2018 model, now the 2020, I'm getting lots of questions. I couldn't answer them because I hadn't used one. So I needed to do it for that reason. Uh, and secondly, the learning curve for me to go to a new device is pretty steep. And now I'm not saying never learn things, but I'm I'm also concerned that I would spend six months getting accustomed to a new environment and that's six months that I could be creating music. So because I don't see a need for it, because I don't see that it's something necessary for me right now, I'm choosing not to. Now for you, if you don't have an up-to-date computer and you want the ability to use the computer stuff and use something like Logic, <coughs> getting all choked up. Uh, then yeah, go ahead and uh, and explore that. I think it's a great platform. I'm pretty jealous of seeing some of the cool things that people can do. Uh, there's Billie Eilish tracks that you can explore, like projects. I was chatting with some folks this week and they were telling me all about the cool Billie Eilish projects that you can uh, you can check out. So uh, yeah, I would consider it, but for me right now, it's not, uh, yeah, it, it's not necessary for me. 
But uh, yeah, as Jade Star says, as soon as it's released on iOS, I'll be there. Absolutely. And that was one of the other reasons, because there's these rumors slash almost confirmations now that we're going to get some professional apps. We're going to get Logic. We're probably going to get other things, maybe Final Cut and other uh, professional apps on the iPad Pro. Eventually, I kind of needed an iPad Pro that could actually run it. So that is my take on that one. Hello to Sion, who's here in the live chat as well. Always good to see you here, my friend. Let's jump back over. We've got a few more questions and then we'll finish off if anyone has any Final questions and is here live. We will answer those. Here's one from BGJPSG. Uh, this is a, can you transpose an imported song from a file on GarageBand iOS? So let's talk transposition as it is uh, as it relates to MIDI. So you can transpose MIDI files if they are in fact MIDI files, if they're virtual instrument files and they're a keyboard instrument. So drums and strings and some of your virtual instruments. You can't transpose for obvious reasons. Strings you can to a certain extent if they're within the right range. But yeah, the short answer here is yes. So let's say you grab a MIDI file and it's a keyboard part and you import it into your song. The benefit of MIDI is that if it's in C major and you're singing along and you're like, no, this is too high for me and you want to bump it down to A major, you can do that. You can do that a couple of ways. You can do it in the settings. So you can change the key. You can put follow key and tempo on in your settings and then you can adjust the BPM, not the BPM, you can adjust the key signature to change it to a different key or you can actually go in and edit the MIDI file. You can manually pull it down so you can just select all and just drag it down and do it, do it sort of old school or there is a transpose option within the MIDI editing settings. So there's a few options you have there. What you can't do is change the pitch or the tempo of an audio recorder track. So if you're importing a song from a file like a WAV file or an MP3 file, an actual audio file, that's what you can't actually import into your, uh, sorry, you can't actually transpose once it's imported. So. Hopefully that helps you out and explains a little bit about the wild world of MIDI and transposing MIDI. Um, question here. So I, I put out a video last night, my time, time, probably this morning for many of you, and it was about the follow option for drummer. So Solrak, uh, my buddy Carlito, says, so is it following audio waves? And the second question is, if I go a little bit, uh, a little bit of beads with the bass, real bass, is it going to play a kick out of beat? Um, so I'm not quite sure of the second part of that question, but yeah, so it, it does. It follows the, it analyzes the audio and it finds the audio wave. So it finds the the hits, the attack of each of that. So th this is to do with the follow option. If you, if you missed the video, the drummer option in GarageBand is very cool because you can just set it to play a pattern or what you can do is you can say, follow this other instrument and it will kind of do a kind of side chainy kind of thing. What it'll do is it will grab and I usually use the bass. So if you have a bass guitar that's going boom, 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 what it will do, it'll put the kick drum with that bass. It'll put like goo, kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare. So it can follow that along. Or if you've got a strumming pattern, do, 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 look at boom, ch, boom, boom, ch. It'll follow that pattern based on what it hears. And it can use not only a virtual instrument, but it'll actually analyze a waveform, which makes me think, why can't it analyze waveforms to do things like um, like the beat detection and that sort of thing? Anyway, that's a story uh, question for another day. But yeah, and th the thing is, if you do, it, it, it will still quantize it. So if you're a little bit off with your bass, so I think that's what you're asking here. If you're a little bit off the beat with your bass, it won't follow it to the point where the drums will sound bad. It'll, it'll sacrifice the syncing of the, the kick and the bass to make it actually sound like a good drum beat. So it'll assume that you are in some sort of zone um, that you're not going to be completely off the beat. But it's a very cool feature. Definitely play around with it. It saves you a lot of time if you want to get a drum sound that does line up with your stuff. All right, we'll continue on. I'll grab another question here. Uh, this is from Pomegranate Pip. Some cool names that come into the world of YouTube. Hi, Pete. Thanks for the video. I have replicated this and my Scarlett 2i2 works fine, but my iPad does not pick it up. It's a first gen 2i2. Could this be the problem? iPad is an iPad Air 2. I get no pops, pop ups when I plug in the USB. So, this is about connecting up an audio interface to an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, so, Pomegranate Pip here is saying they've got an iPad Air 2 and they've got a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 Gen 1. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head if the Gen 1 is not class compliant. I thought it was. 
I'm pretty sure I've heard from folks that have used the Focusrite Scarlet 2i2 Gen 1 and it does work. Okay, in fact, isn't mine a Gen 1? I think so. So it usually comes down to two things. The Lightning to USB adapter, making sure that that's a genuine Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter. And then the second is the power. So either plugging that Lightning to USB 3 power into an AC power adapter or a portable battery or using a powered USB hub. My recommended setup, it's why I say to everyone when they come to me with problems, I say, really, un until you've got a powered USB hub and a Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter, and I know that costs money, it's, that's about $60 US to get that set up, but until you have that set up, I can't guarantee that anything's actually going to work. Even class compliant devices won't work if you've got a dodgy third party adapter and not enough juice getting through to power up your device. So hopefully that helps you out with that one. And I've got a video all about that. If you search my name, Pete John's Audio Interfaces iOS, you'll find a complete video explaining all of that as well. Gravity Culture, this is about how to connect and record a MIDI keyboard. Gravity Culture says, hey, thanks for another video. You're bringing me into this century's recording tech. Always good to hear. A question, please. Can I plug the 49, my iRig HD with USB out, into a powered hub to record simultaneously while charging the iPad 6th gen. This I think I've covered in a couple of previous answers, so we'll just quickly rehash. Uh, short answer is yes. If you want to plug in an audio interface separate to a USB MIDI keyboard, you can. You can have both of those connected at the same time. What you can't have is two different devices that have audio in and out. So if you've got, say, a, a USB microphone and a USB audio interface, plugging both of those in will just confuse things and only one will work or maybe both will just fall down. So you can't do that, but you can indeed plug in a MIDI keyboard and any audio interface that uses USB if you've got a powered USB hub and an Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter. I think I'm just going to, I'll, put, I'll start putting that in my signature. As, as soon as, I'll, I'll set some AI up. J Jade Star will probably help me with this. I'll set some AI up on my email that anytime anyone mentions audio interface and iPad or iPhone, and there's a question mark, it just says, uh, do you have a genuine Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter and a powered USB hub? If yes, then we can keep talking. If no, go and get those things. <laughs> it's not always that, but honestly, 90% of the time, that is the issue that I see folks have. This is exactly the question I was talking about before, but I wanted to give credit. So around the question, it was Brian Wallington who asked about the Mac. Like, why wouldn't I get a MacBook or a Mac instead of an iPad Pro? We talked about that before, mostly so I can help show you find people my experience and answer any questions about the iPad Pro because that's what this channel is pretty much all about. But more power to you if you wanted to choose a Mac or a computer over an iPad. I don't begrudge you at all. Uh, how do you connect a keyboard and a mouse to an iPad or an iPhone is another question we have here. And the answer is, uh, sorry, the question is, do we have to use the same one as you? No. So keyboard and mouse support with iPad from iPad OS 13 and iOS 13 has been a feature. It is a very cool feature and you can use any USB keyboard and mouse, any Bluetooth keyboard and mouse that is going to be compatible. So. No, you don't have to use the ones that I use. You can use the genuine Apple ones if you want to pay a lot for something cool and funky. I know the Magic Keyboard looks cool. I didn't buy one. It was $499 here in Australia. And I just couldn't, couldn't quite go there. So I bought myself a $30 case instead and continue using my USB keyboard and mouse. The thing is, I use my USB keyboard and mouse here in the studio. And when I'm out on the go, I don't really often need. I'm usually just mixing or doing a few things, a little bit of editing. I'm often using the touch screen when I'm on the go. So I didn't see a need for it, but you could go that way. Or you can just buy the cheapest, most generic USB keyboard and you'll be good either way. But remember, if you're using a USB device, yes, genuine Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter is what you need. Let's jump over and I'll just see if we've got any other questions here from the folks who are here live. Tim Osborne, hello to you, Tim. Tim, uh, I'll mention this, I, I did put a link on my channel. If you follow me on the community tab, you've already seen this, but Tim released an epic song called Lockdown. I've had it in my head. I woke up this morning, Tim, singing it to myself. It is very, very cool. He's done a great video. Uh, he's over there in the uh, British Islands in the Gu Guernsey, is it? Um, so he's got some cool photos, put a music, put a song together. I mentioned I give him a shout out. So shout you out, Tim. Go over to Tim's channel. Check out that song. As soon as this show is finished, you will not be disappointed. Really, really good stuff. Um, but yeah, 
that confirming that the Gen 2 is definitely clear. Yeah, I'm, I was sure that the Gen 2 and Gen 3 are, just not sure about the Gen 1. Mirror image. Hi, Pete. Can you check your messenger when you get a chance? Yeah. Um, as I say most weeks on the show here, I do this show so that I can answer a bunch of questions. And if people do have questions, they can jump in live and ask and I'll answer everything. I do get other questions via email, Facebook messenger, Instagram messages, my Facebook page, my Facebook group. Um, so yeah, there's a few places that I have to check in and I do try and catch up, but usually it's between about three and seven days that I can get back to folks. So if you're waiting on a response from me, then uh, yes, please uh, please be patient. I do try and get back to everyone. Uh, but yeah, you, use the group, like use the comment section here, use the Facebook group, create, record, release. A lot of great folks that know a lot of things. And if it's GarageBand or iPad related, iPad musician group, GarageBand users group. I've said before, even if you don't use Facebook, just sign up so you can join the groups because Facebook groups are where it's at. I, I promise you, Facebook groups have so many very, very cool uh, ways to interact with people and so many good people that are sharing so much music and so much knowledge that you really should be there. That's my view anyway. Let's just do one final check for final questions and then we will see if we can finish off here. Uh, Jeff Rush says, so will Logic, etc. only be available for iPad Pro or all for iPads? Not clear yet, Jeff. The, the word is that they'll be professional apps. Now, Apple have never done this before. There are no apps that are only, actually, is that true? There's no apps available on Pro? I know there's sort of some games and things that need a certain generation of processor, but I'm pretty sure right now anything, any device that can run iOS 13 can run pretty much any Apple apps that are currently released. I think that might change. So there's word that they may only run on the Pro. Someone else may be able to speculate more on that. But uh, yes, it's it's likely that they'll release these Pro apps just for the Pro. Um, we had a question here from Oscar. I've got to do, stop doing that. <laughs> I was listening to a live stream t this morning and it made me think uh, about comfort words. Do you have any comfort words that you use? Mine is usually just... Uh, like I don't have a specific word, but when I've listened back, I usually, I used to um, and now I seem to ah, so go figure. So ah, uh, but I also do this before I say things and it's really irritating. So please uh, pick me up on it and tell me, tell me that I'm bad and I should feel bad. No, the, the, the stream I was listening to, the person said the word like about every third word and they were delivering some really good content. But after about five minutes, I simply like couldn't listen to what they were like saying anymore because like it really like was hard to like understand what they were like saying because they just like use like so much. And I'm not saying that to, to be mean. I was like like that as well. But yeah, it, it shows that you do need to. The only reason I listen back to my own stuff is to analyze that and go, was there anything super irritating in that? I'm like, oh, yes, there was. I went, ah, like 15 times. Anyway, that's not relevant to your question. <laughs> what is the point of having an external mixer for someone who uses a DAW, basically everyone? So the way it breaks down, I've done a video about mixers versus audio interfaces. The way I break it down is that if you are in a home studio and you are recording just yourself to record multi-track recording, say you play guitar or keys or you sing, get yourself a two-channel interface, a Steinberg UI22C or a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, and you'll be good to go because all the processing that you need to do is going to be at the back end. All you really need to do is get your sound into your DAW. And this is probably what you're talking about. The time where you need a mixer is if you're doing stuff like I'm doing here. So I'm doing a live show right now. I've got my vocals going through my mixer. I've got my theme music that I can put in there. I've got my iPad audio coming through in the stereo channel. I've got the ability to on the fly, turn up and down volumes to EQ things on the go. So if my voice for a live stream, I want to change the EQ, I can do that. I can add in effects at the flick of a switch. So there's a bunch of things that you can do with a mixer for live streaming. Same if you're doing a podcast, and you've got a bunch of different people and you want to get a mix of say four different microphones down, a mixer can be a good low, uh, low effort way of doing that, doing all the mixing up front. So it really depends on, do you need to do the mixing? Do you need to actually mix your audio before it hits the recording or the streaming? Or do you do it all afterwards? If it's before, go for a mixer. And the beauty of a mixer is something like the Zoom Live Track L8 you can also use to record even just a, a stereo mixer that only has stereo USB output. You can still use that to record. But if you want the simplicity and you're doing all your processing afterwards, I would go for a audio interface because it is a simpler option. It's easier to get started with. Less can go wrong. 
it's plug and play. And uh, yeah, then you can do all your mixing and processing at the other end. Hopefully that helps you out there with that question, my friend. We are going to have to finish off. There's that sound. We are going to have to finish off there. So thank you if you're here watching live and you got some value out of this, or if you're watching on the replay, please hit the like button. That just tells me that you want to see more shows just like this one. If you're watching on the podcast or you like your stuff to be audio, then subscribe to the podcast. Just search Home Studio Q&A in any of your favorite podcast listening places. And of course, for all of the other information that you could possibly need about home and mobile recording, head over to studiolivetoday.com. Thanks for being here, folks. Stay safe. Keep creating. I'll see you next time.